Chuck Olenek. I'm a reenactor. And for 36 years, I used historical reenactment, not just as a hobby on the weekends, but also a way to lure my kids into the subject of history and get them to realize that, hey, history is pretty cool. But I'm not in the classroom anymore. So I had to try to find a way to put all this garb that I have at home to use and also how to channel that passion for bringing the past to life. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking a deep dive into California history because I did not get to teach that stuff when I was in the classroom due to curriculum restrictions. And I've always been fascinated by passing a marker, you know, it's a hey, historical site, you know, okay, well, what happened here? And I'm trying to visit as many of these places and connect the dots and tell the stories while I'm in guard. So I started with the missions, and I visited the missions and the presidios and assistencias, and I told the different parts of the story in uh, various garb that I was wearing. Well then, in researching the missions, I found out that there were a number of very famous outlaws that used to hang out at uh, saloons that were inside the secularized missions. And that sort of blew my mind, one, that there were saloons inside the missions, but also, did these famous people ever meet? So I started researching that more, and that led to a new project of chasing banditos and lawmen. Well, now that I'm looking at these guys who are robbing people, some of them were holding up stages, and that got me to thinking. Except for, you know, what I would see in Westerns, I didn't really think about stages all that much before. You know, in a Western, the stage is the vehicle to quite literally a vehicle, but it was the vehicle to dump the various members of, uh, you know, the cast, you know, who were part of the story into it, and, you know, they interact, or it becomes a target for uh, marauding Indians or fierce banditos, you know, but there's always something there, and I started wondering, well, how does a stage could put together. What are the various parts? How does it work? So what we're going to do is we're going to head over to San Juan Capistrano where A, there's a mission, but there's also a lot of buildings from the time period and that in one of those buildings includes a livery stable with a stagecoach. So I hope you will stick with me on my journey. It was the gold rush that forced California to develop roadways, to develop express companies, mail service. And this was because you had that huge flood of 49ers coming in, of miners seeking the golden dream. And they are not willing to leave their claims. They were willing to pay dearly to have their gold transport and silver transported in safety and have their mail brought, have their supplies brought up, never mind how much supplies could cost. Before the gold rush, a single head of cattle, somewhere between two and $10 would cost $80. Um, a newspaper from back east, which would cost five cents there, People up in the mining areas would eagerly pay 50 cents or a couple of dollars to get a newspaper. So what ended up happening is the first stage lines started showing up in California in 1849. Four years later, Sacramento had 12 companies competing with each other. Well, eventually what's going to end up happening is there's going to be mergers taking place and acquisitions and smaller companies forced out of business until there's one, Wells Fargo. And I have a map that shows 
a bunch of, it shows the roads for the stages are in black. And then the red dots on the map, those are the stage stations that were in California by 1860. And you're gonna notice that there's a whole bunch near the mother load area. And then you have the gold dots. That's to show the Wells Fargo stations that came in by 1880. Okay, time to check out the livery stable and see what kind of stagecoaches they have. The Concord stagecoach with its curved egg-shaped bottom and wood paneling weighing in at about 2,500 pounds was the brainchild of the Abbott Downing Company in Concord, New Hampshire and was produced for over 70 years. They were high-end expensive vehicles. They'd cost about $1,500 as opposed to canvas top celerity or mud wagons at $500. The cost was justified by long service life. The thorough brace suspension fashioned from the prime portions of 14 ox hides reduced stresses on the structure and improved passenger comfort. Okay, these two are pretty much mud wagons or celerities. Notice that it isn't really a hard roof, that it's uh, canvas or fabric. The all important wheels were made of straight grained ash or white oak, seasoned for three years. Each spoke was shaped by hand to the exact weight and measurement of the other spokes in the same wheel, then mortised in so tightly into the fellies that they couldn't be removed by hand. To make the outer iron tire, a circular iron band smaller than the wheel was expanded by heat, set around the wooden rim, then plunged into cold water. When the tire cooled, everything was locked into place. The front wheels of the stagecoach were made smaller than the rear wheels so the stagecoach could make sharp turns. The stagecoach driver rode on the right side of the front seat, which rested two feet down from the roof and was supported by a flexible boot which was used as a footrest and a baggage carrier where those heavy reinforced treasure boxes were stored. You might recognize boot as the British term for trunk. Because the Concord body continuously shifted, the driver sat slightly askew and braced himself with the aid of a steeply angled footboard. Unable to keep his reins in a steady contact with the horse's mouths, the driver bent his arms and elbows to constantly compensate and his body always leaned slightly forward. The reins in his left hand controlled the horses on what was called the near side and the ones in his right hand for the off side. Keep in mind the driver was working with four to six horses, maybe more. Two horses alone would very soon tire. The bottom rein for each hand controlled the two horses nearest the coach's wheels, called the wheel horses. Duh. The middle reins of each hand guided the two middle or swing horses and the top reins controlled the leaders or leads. His right hand also had to control his whip used on the wheel horses. The back wheels had brake blocks acting on the iron tires. The driver controlled them with a foot lever to his right at the side of his footboard. Next to the driver is going to be the person who is called the messenger and he's going to be carrying the shotgun in order to help defend the stage. Gee! Guess what we call when we want to sit next to the driver in the front seat? Sometimes a passenger would have to ride in between the driver and the messenger. In that case, if you're riding up there, you're going to get a decent ride. Maybe a little breezy, but you'll get a decent ride. But you better be providing the driver and probably the messenger liquor and tobacco. A tailgate or rear boot supported by straps from the top of the coach was covered with oiled leather and lined with a waterproofed canvas to safeguard more luggage, express parcels, and mail. The coach itself on the Wells Fargo and Company ones was painted red with the name in gold leaf. There were leather flaps on the windows. Up to nine passengers could be seated, which would certainly be a cause for rules of etiquette. The roof of the coach bulged slightly for the purpose of draining and was surmounted on the back and sides with an iron railing to accommodate baggage. 
Here too, up to nine passengers could be seated in a pinch. Okay, so now we know the various parts of the stagecoach and we have an idea how it works. But I've got too much stuff to cover and I'm still trying to get towards the very first stagecoach holdup. And that's part of it. So that'll be in the, hopefully in the next video. Stick with me.